That Great Business Show, Ireland's Best Business Podcast. Welcome to episode 151 of That Great Business Show, where we bring you loads of great tips, insights, and unique business opportunities on every episode all perfectly packaged into a commute-friendly podcast. And it's all with thanks to donedeal.ie. I'm Conal Moran, Voitistiach. A slightly different podcast this time. BNP Paribas Bank is Europe's largest bank and it's celebrating 50 years in Ireland. Irish people love learning what others think of us, so we want an outsider's view on what's going on economically in Ireland and whether some of those post-Brexit milk and honey promises of massive financial services transfers from the UK to Ireland have been delivered. And this being the Great Business Show, we'll have plenty more besides. That's coming up. But first, a hugely positive reaction to episode 150 when we had the Bordieski of Vara boss, that's Caroline Bokel, as well as Anna-Marie Turley from Enterprise Ireland on, who between them told us about a combined 1.5 billion, yep, billion pot of money available to all kinds of businesses. So if you're looking for money for your business, no matter what size, it's a must listen episode. That's episode 150 sitting on a platform, podcast platform ready for you right now. All our tips and insights are brought to you thanks to Dundee Motors, the place to look for your new or previously loved car, van or truck. Dundeal.com. I.E. Dun Deal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dun Deal. Are you looking for a seven-seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. Visit dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on that great business show.com. That great business show. Now, today's VIP guest is an old friend of mine. Well, an old friend in that Irish sense that I haven't seen for about a quarter of a century before he walked into the studio just 10 minutes ago. I worked with Derek Kyo when we were stockbroking with Rida Abian Amro back in the day. And since then, Derek has gone on to much greater things, spending the last 21 years with BNP Paribas, Europe's largest bank. And for the last eight years, Derek has been CEO and country manager for Ireland at BNP Paribas, a company that is now celebrating 50 years in this country. And he wants to talk about the 50th birthday party, but I'd like to get his perspective and the perspective of HQ in Paris, France, about Ireland's economy and what kind of weirdos they may think we are. We are the business podcast after all. Derek Kyo, welcome to That Great Business Show. Oh, thank you very much, and it's great to see you. You haven't changed a bit, I have to say. It's a long time. It really, really is a very long time. You are in charge of 550 employees here. Out of 185,000 people working for the bank worldwide, do they even know that Dublin exists? Absolutely. Uh, very much so. Uh, <laughs> we, we are a key part of the of the franchise. I mean, within BNP Paribas, they divide themselves into three separate poles of business. So you obviously have the largely retail banking activities, which we don't do in Ireland, corporate and institutional banking, which is our main footprint in Ireland, and then roughly speaking, everything else, which would be insurance, asset management, and so on. So as, as part of the corporate and institutional bank, we play a very, very important role within EMEA for BNP Paribas. 
and they know Ireland, you know Ireland exceptionally well, why haven't they got a, an ordinary retail bank operating here yet? Please note, yet. Yeah. Smile in his face. Well, mm. I, I mean, there, <laughs> there's no easy answer to that question, Colin, but I'll give you the, the, two, the two basic reasons. One, it's a very, very small market. Two, uh, I am not aware of a single instance of a non-Irish bank coming into the Irish retail market and ever making any money. Uh, and I can think of multiple examples of banks losing a packet. Well, I mean, Ulster Bank did okay for a couple of hundred years. I don't know how long they were here. They were here for definitely over 100 years, weren't they? But it's, they were, to be fair. But it's a bit like the airline industry. Cumulatively, did they make any money? I, I don't know. You need to ask the people in Ulster Bank that. But it's, it's a small, concentrated market that's heavily exposed to mortgage lending. Um, and it's by no means certain that it, when you look at the Irish mortgage market that you, you have this secured lending business, but can you actually take security over the asset if, uh, yeah, if the borrower defaults? And the answer is no. Uh, you know, it, it, we're, we must be one of the only countries in the world where you can, you can buy a house for 2 million euro, stop paying your mortgage after three months and still be living in the house 15 years later. So, spoken that's, like a that's, true that's banker. That's why I don't really want to do it. Well, I couldn't go into a Ferrari dealership, yeah. buy a Ferrari, stop paying the payments after two months, and uh, and keep possession of the car for the three years. So there's there's a dichotomy there, you know. No, I have uh, heard, heard and people, other people saying exactly the same, and it is true. Of course, it's true. So explain what, exactly what BNP Paribas does do in Ireland. Sure. Well, we we have we have multiple business lines in Ireland, but. The primary business is we cater for large corporates and large institutions. So we, as I said, we don't we don't cater for SMEs. We don't cater uh, within the retail market. Uh, we are looking at basically the top, roughly speaking, the top thirty domestic corporates by either market value or market turnover or, or revenue. And then we would have a very large franchise for multinational corporates who who, who have businesses in Ireland, about three hundred and fifty multinational corporates. Um, globally, the bank would operate, would have a physical footprint in about 65 countries. Uh, and we operate on a one bank basis. So if you are a key client of the bank in Brazil, for argument's sake, but you need certain banking services in Ireland, then we're going to be there for you. Come here to me. I have to cut across there because mm -hmm. you and I worked with ABN AMRO, a Dutch bank, and we had a happy time there. But there was one glaring issue. They did not operate as a single bank, to my yeah. memory, it was each unit was against each other. Yeah, and and in fairness, when I joined BNP Paribas, it was largely the same. How did uh, they get around it? Because our current group chief executive, Jean-Laurent Bonifay, when he took over in 2011, his first initiative, and he would say to this day, probably the most important decision he ever made was to set up one bank for corporates. Uh, we're one bank for institutions as well now. So that was a key initiative. Well, what did he do? Um, knock people's heads together. Well, create how do you create do that? the mindset. Um, like every bank and every large organization has this problem of yeah. units being, as you say, Brazil versus Paris, and they still don't like each other and yeah. will deal with the opposition. It, it's a long journey, Connell. I mean, lots of things were happening from 2011 up to 2023, not least of which was the, let's say, the cultural and conduct journey that corporate and institutional banks generally are on anyway. Uh, and and we at BNP Paribas had to had to embrace that you know very very aggressively. So as part of the conduct journey, clearly you know individual behaviours are key, and people just looking after their own little patch or you know looking after their client to the exclusion of everybody else is is not tolerated. And that is the problem. What is the solution? Because AB and Amro couldn't find one. The solution is that people cannot be judged purely by their quantitative performance. The qualitative metrics have to be equally as important. And it's as simple as that. So when we look at appraising people, we do it on a quantitative and a qualitative basis. Of course, it's, you, you know, if you're a client-facing individual, you have to uh, produce the numbers, but you can't behave like a jerk. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> there has to be a balance. And it's as, it is, ultimately, it's as simple as that. And 185,000 hmm. people to try to corral, that is vast. It's vast, but, you know, retail banking obviously consumes a lot of headcount. So within the domestic markets activities, as we call it, there's probably about 60,000 people. Within the corporate and institutional bank, there's there's another roughly 45,000. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge business. But, you, you know, you, you divide it into three parts and you try and operate it as simply as possible. I mean, the original 
I suppose, visionary for the BNP Paribas model was uh, Michel Pebereau, who, uh, who, who was the one who engineered the acquisition of Paribas back in 1999. At that time, he said he only needed four people to run a bank. Him, obviously. Uh, a good CFO, a good COO, and a good head of HR. Now, the world has become a lot more complicated since then, but you get the principle, right? If you have very, very good lieutenants just beneath you and they have good lieutenants beneath them, you've got a trickle-down effect. And I only learned today that the Paribas name came from the Payi Ba. Mm, so the low right. countries. Yeah. That's right. So it's that's funny, right. we were talking about ABN Amaro being yeah. a Dutch company, but yeah. the Payi Ba is, the, uh, is the, the low countries, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So what you forgot to mention, though, because I've been reading about the bank here, You've also got a unit in Galway. We have a unit in Galway, which is... Uh, They'd be very upset if you forgot about them. No, no, no. Our <laughs> Galway colleagues are a key part of the franchise, to be fair. And back in 2015, uh, our security services business, which is basically that part of our bank that looks after the assets of our clients after they've acquired them, uh, whether it be bonds or equities or, um, or private capital assets. Uh, in 2015, we bought uh, the the asset servicing business that's purely dedicated to hedge funds from Credit Suisse and inherited the Galway office at that time. But it's proven to be a fantastic success for us. Um, a question about that. Why would a French-owned company not just haul that back into Paris or somewhere in France? Why leave it in Galway? Because A, you've got the expertise, you've got the local expertise. So there's no guarantee that Let's just say we, we, we did your, we took the, the nuclear option and said, we'll close Galway and we'll um, locate in Paris. Well, A, that the, the employees may not transfer. B, the clients may not want to be serviced out of Paris. And C, you may not get the expertise in Paris that you need to continue to service the clients. So you're running a serious risk with your business model if you do something like that. And also, by the way, you can't have everything in Paris because it's an expensive location <laughs> apart from anything else. Yeah, but Dublin is pretty uh, close to, in terms of compar uh, price comparison, would it not be? It depends on what metric you use. Uh, I mean, in so in, in Ireland, people are not as expensive as they are in Paris. When you take everything into consideration, like social charges, pension contributions, all of that, they're not as expensive. Do you know, uh, what, is it 10%, 20%, 30% differential? Well, let me give you an example. If we bring an expatriate from Paris to Dublin, Say, you know, your average uh, nuclear family, family uh, individual partner, two kids. To achieve net pay equivalents, uh, yeah. we're, you know, we, we would be struggling to, to, get, to achieve net pay equivalents um, by paying any less than probably double what they earn in Paris. But it's still cheaper when you include the social charges. So you say, OK, gross salary, for argument's sake, is 50,000 euros. We need to pay 100,000 euros because our tax base is, is so sort of progressive, shall we call it, in Ireland. <laughs> Debatable point. But we don't have the same level of social charges because the French pension system is very, very different. Okay. So it's, talking, it's, yeah. it's much, much more expensive ultimately for the individual. Uh, at an employer level, it's more expensive in Paris than it is in, in Ireland. So good news for us is we remain competitive yeah. at one level anyway versus yeah. Paris. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and, which, and and relative to many other jurisdictions as well, which is a nice segue into the question that I've been uh, thinking about when I knew that you were coming on was, we were promised. I'm not blaming you or anybody, but we were promised that we were going to get all of this financial services business coming in uh, from the UK uh, once they left the uh, EU, but it hasn't really happened. And as far as I'm reading, so much of it, of it has gone to Paris, which is ironic. Yeah. Okay, so we, we have we have benefited from Brexit. Okay, I mean, we when I think you know two two classic cases in point would be Bank of America who moved their uh, holding company to Ireland, Barclays who moved their holding company to Ireland, and uh, both moved a considerable amount of assets and, and brought a, a number of people as well and, and continue to hire people. Uh, Citigroup Europe was was based in Ireland pre Brexit and has continued to grow post Brexit. The, the reality of Europe is that it is, we, we, you know, it's not, there is no single financial center within the EU. Okay, you've got Dublin, you've got Amsterdam, you've got Luxembourg, Paris, Frankfurt. Uh, London is a financial ecosystem that was built up over 400 years. It's not going to disappear overnight. 
what I would think, I mean, if I'm to create an analogy on it, you look at, you know, you get a crack in the windscreen of your car and say, it's okay, it's only a crack, but it's fine. Suddenly the crack gets bigger and bigger and then one day the glass shatters. We're a long way from the glass shattering with London as a financial services centre. But the fact of the matter is, unless we have uh, a very, very close regulatory alignment between, uh, between the UK and Europe, then London will, I think, believe will continue to lose financial services to Europe. And it will continue to lose financial services to Dublin as well. We've got a lot to offer. I mean, for, in, on the insurance and asset management side, for example, we have been big beneficiaries of Brexit. But maybe in more sort of high octane, glitzier things like trading, we haven't. But maybe that's not the end of the world. Because, and I only learned this from you just before you came in, we were just having the chat, and you said something to me that I hadn't really thought about, is that it doesn't actually need human beings anymore. In Not trading. as much as it used to, no. When you uh, and I were yeah. trading, we'd be yeah. on a phone and we'd be shouting and roaring at each other or whatever. But no it's more. all becoming automated. Uh, and, you know, you, you will remember, Colonel, back in, our, back in our day, that quarter century ago, everything was an open outcry system, whether it be on the stock exchange or within the futures markets. All of that is gone. And, you know, when I, when I walk onto the trading floor in London now, you're greeted by more or less total silence. Banks and banks of computer screens and guys studying them. But there's really not that open outcry system that we were used to. So it's not about noise. It's about, it's about algos. Algos being algorithms. And the people looking at those screens are maths graduates. Absolutely. Maths, maths and, uh, and computer science, yeah. So good, good programmers are always, always in demand on trading floors. But, uh, so wasters like you and I, no chance anymore. No, I, I, I would respectfully disagree because I, and I've had this conversation with somebody else, I think that uh, it's fine to be able to, to answer certain questions black or white. And, and, and a maths graduate or an engineering graduate are fantastic. They can see the world in black and white. But not every answer is a black and white answer. So I'm a big believer in the arts and I think people need to be able to think in three dimensions. Um, and there sometimes there is not a black or white answer. And you are talking your own book because you are an arts graduate. Well, yeah, I'm a graduate <laughs> of the dismal science <laughs> <laughs> economics, economics yes. exactly, which came under arts back in the day anyways. Yeah. So what are the opportunities that you do see for Ireland that we could, should be chasing hugely, furiously at the moment? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the sustainable finance agenda is obviously on the, on the tip of everybody's tongue. The, the transition that's going to be required in Europe, but globally, but let's just talk about Europe for the moment, is going to be enormous. Uh, Ireland did a very good job over the last 30 years of becoming a centre of excellence for, for example, the funds industry, a centre of excellence in the insurance industry. So maybe the future is that we become the centre of excellence for sustainable finance. And that, that means that you create enough um, individual expertise in the subject that you, you develop a cluster effect and people place, I say people, organisations place business here because they know that they can get the bodies that they need to do that type of business. So sustainable financing is going to be huge. Uh, the whole transition is something that we collectively need to think very, very carefully about how it's going to be financed. It's not going to be financed just from banks' balance sheets because that's, you know, we're talking about trillions. It's just simply not feasible. So where would uh, that finance come from? Well, what it, what it comes from, it's going to come from insurance companies, pension funds. Um, what we need in Europe is an efficient capital markets union that will allow institutional investors like pension funds and asset managers and insurance companies to lend the money via intermediaries like BNP Paribas uh, to, to the corporate borrowers that need to, to finance their, their projects. And what is the holdup there? Old-fashioned borders? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have a single market, but we have 27 countries. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, there, there is a political dimension to it. I think at, um, at the level probably of the European Commission, there is a very strong um, advocacy for capital markets union. But at the political level, it's a little bit more difficult. I'll come back to how the world sees us and the matter is probably uh, political in a second because I have to take a quick break. And uh, I'm with Derek Kyo, who's Chief Executive Officer with uh, PNP Paribas here in Dublin. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be back after this. Dom Deal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dom Deal. 
Are you looking for a seven-seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. Visit Dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. And I'm here with Derek Kyo, CEO of BNP Paribas in Dublin here. And uh, we're just there talking about, Derek, the broader political issues, as in 27 countries, uh, single EU. But I often wonder, from your perspective, because you really do have an outsider's view, what are they thinking about us? Do they still feel, because I've read it, that they we're still scamming the tax system? Or are we, do, are we kind of outliers or cowboys in the European system, according to the people that you might meet? So the short answer is yes. To which one? <laughs> the, the, the to, to, the well, to the, the to the you know are we are we scamming the the corporate tax the global corporate tax system? The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, but it's changing. And I think Ireland signing up to the OECD principles, where we will commit to a minimum effective tax rate of fifteen percent, is a very very positive thing. Had no choice. I know we had no choice, but it's still the right thing to do. I mean, um, you know, it, it, one could argue that it's too long in coming. I mean, I, you know, the economist in me says we subsidize capital too much in this country and we tax labor too much. Uh, I mean, that's I'm saying that as, a, as an individual taxpayer, but also as somebody who's responsible for a corporation that's been in Ireland since 1973. So we didn't come here for the tax rates. We ignore the fantastic selling points we have as a country. Highly educated workforce, probably that I think outside of Lithuania, we have the highest percentage of under 35s with a university education uh, in the I EU. I know we say that, but... But it's important. Are, but are they, oh, of course it is, but are they trained in the right things? You were talking there about your maths graduates and uh, all that. The Lithuanians and many in the east of Europe are hugely more advanced in terms of maths than we are. But it's not just about maths, uh, and that goes back to what I said to you earlier on. I mean, we we need to have more than ever, diversity of thought in at our executive level, right through our organization so that people can challenge and people can ask questions. If you had a trading floor, for example, full of just maths graduates, well, then, you know, the propensity for blow ups is enormous, right? Because they say, well, the model says we should do this. So therefore, let's go all in on this because the model is never wrong. We built it. But we know from 2008, the model is frequently wrong. That's just a, a, an example, an extreme example of why we need diversity of, of graduates. In fairness, in Ireland, we, we are also very lucky. We are the only country in the EU that has a dedicated minister for financial services. We're the only country in the EU that has a financial services three-year, five-year rolling strategy. Uh, I, I sat on the industry advisory group for a number of years. It does get things done. It works very, very closely with SkillsNet Ireland and others and the universities to to ensure that we are getting the kind of uh, degree courses that are required. So, I, I, I mean, I'd be highly confident that we are we are very, very cohesive in that regard. And it's the beauty of being a small country as well, by the way. And that is the level of education or the standard of education now. You mentioned other benefits or other attractions of Ireland. Yeah, I mean, I mean, OK, so we have... So aside from the tax, we have a very, very young, highly educated population, sort of over 50% of the population under the age of 35. Who can't afford a house, of course, which must be said. But, you know, your financial services entity doesn't have to be based in Dublin. It can be based in Galway. It can be based in Gorey. It can be based in Dundalk. They're all only an hour from Dublin. It can be based in Athlone. New Ross. You better mention New it, Ross. It can be based in New Ross, my That'd hometown. Be... <laughs> Absolutely. And, but I mean, in fairness, we have, okay, not in New Ross itself, but in Wexford, uh, Boney Mellon have a big uh, operation. In Kilkenny, State Street are, are uh, present and, and others as well. So it doesn't have to be in Dublin. First point. Second point is we have within the IDA a state agency that is absolutely on top of bringing companies to Ireland, looking after companies when they get to Ireland. And they are very focused on getting companies to think outside of Dublin. You probably only need, if I was to start on a greenfield site in Ireland, I think I'd probably only have 10% of my uh, employees in Dublin and 90% outside Dublin. Th and those 10% are the ones that are dealing with the regulator or the government bodies are, you know, are generally on an adv advocacy basis need to be based in Dublin. The other 90% don't need to be based in Dublin. 
That's the reality. Now, you've been in business here a long time. You're of an age. You are mature. You are reflective. What would Derek Kyo do for the country, with the country? What would you advise the Minister for Finance and Minister for Industry to do in the broadest sense? I just want to know what's your thinking, what's going on in your head? So what are the things that, well, I'll flip it a little bit, Connell, if I may. What are the impediments to us bringing more business into Ireland um, and bringing more people into Ireland? Personal taxation rates are a big problem. The general uh, hostility, it was the only word I can think of, towards financial services generally is is an impediment. Um, and, you know, I understand the, the legacy reasons for that. There was a, a very, very painful period for Ireland post the financial crash in 2008. However, we should not set aside the fact that international financial services, which is very different, to be fair, to domestic banking, um, in wages alone, contributed almost a billion euros to the Irish economy last year, contributed over 2.5 billion in corporate tax revenue. It's a very, very important part of, uh, uh, you know, of the tax take in Ireland um, and, and contributes greatly to the Irish economy. Um, but there is, there is generally a perception abroad that, that there's still quite a significant hostility within the media and within body politic towards financial services in its broadest possible sense. That, that's not helpful. And we don't play up the fact, for example, that we have an excellent Minister for Financial Services who's completely motivated to growing financial services in Ireland. We have a regulator who is, I would say, tough but fair. Um, and we should not harp on too much about the fact that they're tough and harp on more about the fact that they're fair. Okay, you know, I mean, <laughs> I so have my, my heard point... some people in a senior level like yourself in financial services who find the regulator to be pedantic almost in terms of putting people off and putting too many boxes to tick. It's, it's not, well, A, it's not our experience, firstly. Secondly, having a first-class regulator and a first-class financial services centre are not mutually exclusive things. In actual fact, they should complement each other, okay? So, you know, it is very, very important to counter, you know, the, the phrase you used a little bit earlier about sort of the Wild West. We, we need to prove we're not the Wild West because that was, I mean, I think it was the Time magazine article, wasn't it, back in 2005 or 2006? Way Six. too far back for me to remember. Well, yeah, you were only a boy. Uh, but, you know, that was that referenced Ireland as being the wild west of financial services. So we need to build credibility. And in order to do that, you need to have a top class regulator. So, I, I mean, you know, pedantic. I, 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 I think that the regulator, my experience and particularly my recent experience, uh, very much so dur during the pandemic as well, when when nobody really knew in the early stages what was going on, what the risks were in the system, how we were going to... The regulator was incredibly proactive, incredibly uh, engaged with, uh, with the industry, both on the domestic banking side and on the international banking side. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, they, they have their principles. Of course, they can improve their processes, but sure, we all can improve our processes. You know, I mean, nobody is perfect, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's an evolving story. Into the micro level, what would you do at the micro level in Ireland to make our little country a happier, more prosperous country? Yeah, wow. Uh, <laughs> how much time do we have left? Uh, a, look, Ireland is a fantastic place to, to raise a family. I raised my family here. It's, Dublin is an amazing city to live and work in. But we, we clearly have a problem on housing. We have a problem generally, I would say, in terms of public infrastructure. Um, we have a problem still in the health system. So, you know, at a simplistic level, if I'm paying 52 cents in every euro there or thereabouts in my, uh, out of my paycheck into, into the exchequer, I think I have a reasonable right to demand that my children get a good ed education, that if I get sick, I can get a hospital bed, that I can get around the city safely <laughs> and, and efficiently. I'm not sure we're delivering on any of those things at this point in time. So my question back to you would be, where does all the money go? Oh, well, you're, uh, you answer. I'm, uh, no, so, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that, that, that you know, there, we, we need to develop a long-term vision for the country. Not, and, and I think there's always a risk in, in any democracy that people only think in terms of election cycles as opposed to what is the long-term vision. And our, we need a long-term vision for Ireland because we're, we're in many respects, bursting at the seams. But, we, we, you know, in order to continue to grow, uh, we need to start investing. And I hear all of these 
you know, sovereign wealth funds and, uh, you know, we're going to have two sovereign wealth funds, I think, by the end of the year. And but the we need of, capital investment. And the use of those two funds, it's being used for weird stuff. For example, and I know you don't want to get involved in the politics of this, but as a an investment professional, as you are and you were, when the uh, funds start investing in startup companies, does that not make you kind of go, oh, oh hang on a second? Uh, look, uh, honestly, I, I think our needs are... I. I of course, we need to encourage innovation. I have no problem with that. And like any good investor, yourself included, Colin, you're going to you're going to apportion a portion of your portfolio to startups. I don't know what portion they're talking about, but I hope it's relatively small. Teeny, I hope. But yeah. the fact that it's meant to be a pension fund, a state pension fund, if you like, yeah, to put pension fund into startups. Nah, so, look, I mean, I'm not sure what the governance around it will be. I just haven't seen it. And and I, I get my information like you from the rest of the media. But if we look at the example of Norway, for example, which has the ultimate sovereign wealth fund built from their oil riches, from the North Sea oil, that is completely unpoliticized. OK, so politicians cannot touch uh, the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund. And that's the way it should be for Ireland as well, because politicians with the best will in the world, have projects. And those projects can be short-term and esoteric and impractical. So we need to ensure that is the politics of, of our sovereign wealth fund is completely divorced from the investment management. You mentioned that we are bursting at the seams. And one of the issues that we do have, albeit that there have been a few uh, blips in the last short while, hiring people. How are you finding hiring good people? Actually, not so much of a problem. We had a problem last year. So, you know, we went through the pandemic where staff turnover was less than 2%. I mean, it was nothing. Nobody was going anywhere. That was understandable. They couldn't. We were locked they couldn't, down. No, but, it, you know, there was just no, there was no movement whatsoever. Uh, then when we emerged from the pandemic, the beginning of 2022, we saw staff turnover beginning to rise. So the great resignation that everybody spoke about. Some people were restless. They wanted to move. There was lots of reasons. It probably spiked in Q2 2022 when we had about 15% turnover. But Whoa, it, yeah, yeah, it, that's a lot. Yeah, it, it, so, so I, I'm comfortable with 10%. Over 15%, I start to get a little bit uh, look, looking for, for trends. But, you know, we've seen, I mean, for example, a number of the tech companies have, have gone into reverse in terms of hiring in, in Ireland. We saw the news from Accenture yesterday. Um so we, we saw a significant softening in terms of turnover over the second half of last year. And we don't really have a problem um, attracting people. Now, we, you know, we, we, we have, a, a, I think, a very good benefits package for people who are joining the bank. And, and banking, you know, is generally seen as a boring business, I suppose. But stability can be good at a point in time, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we, you know, we've been here for 50 years. We plan on staying here for at least another 50 years. Uh, and, and we've got lots of different roles that people can, can play. So we have transversal mobility within the territory and internationally. So we've got a lot to offer people. And will Derek Kyo be staying with the bank for the next 50 years? Uh, for the next 50? <laughs> 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 if there's chirogenic freezing, possibly, Colin. <laughs> but but uh, I, I've had a wonderful career at PNP Paribas. I've enjoyed every single minute of it. And I certainly don't have any plans to go anywhere else. You have a final question, which is, who would you hire in a heartbeat? So I knew you were going to ask me this, Colin. I'm glad <laughs> because not a lot of people seem to read their emails, but you have. Yes, and I, I have actually put some thought into it. And I, I think, you know, over the last three years, who is the person that has most positively influenced me and, and, and brought me from the sort of dark places that we all went in the pandemic? The person I would hire in a heartbeat is Professor Luke O'Neill. Oh, yeah. Uh, fantastically intelligent individual, entrepreneurial, we know, and a very successful entrepreneur, great sense of humor, optimistic at all times, solutions driven. Uh, so, you know, I always, uh, when I'm hiring somebody, I ask myself two questions. Can they do the job and can I work with them? And I have no doubt that he would absolutely tick the box for both. I've never met him, but he, he, he was, I, I lived for his Sunday Indo column every week to give us some hope when there was no hope elsewhere. And as you say, he's a very successful entrepreneur. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The one person I thought that you were going to mention, because I remembered that uh, one of the previous BNP employees was David McWilliams. We never crossed paths, <laughs> I'd have to say. He, he was in, I think he was in Paraban in London, but it was in the late 90s. So I, I've never, 
You never had the pleasure. Me. You were with me back then, wasn't it? Oh no, yeah. late nineties. No, no, I was good long gone at that. But there's only ever room in, in in any room for one economist. <laughs> Connell, and that's me. <laughs> that's <so. you. laughs> that is Derek. Derek Kyo, who is CEO and has been for the last eight plus years of BNP Paribas Bank. I better wish you a happy fiftieth. Not you, but no. your bank. A happy fiftieth birthday, because there is another story that we didn't get into, which is it all started in a Burlington hotel bedroom. That's correct. Well, that was the first office, but the actual the bank began in Ireland when George Colley, who was Minister for Finance, was doing a tour of the the founding members of the EEC, and he sat at a dinner beside the then chairman of BNP and uh, asked the chairman of BNP, did he know anything about Ireland? And the guy said, yeah, absolutely. I sail off the coast of Cork every year. And he said, well, would you open a bank? And he said, yes, I will. And that's, <laughs> so there you go, sliding doors. As happens, we could have further chat about that, but we have run out of time. So, Derek, thank you so much for joining us on that great business show. Dun Deal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dun Deal. Are you looking for a seven-seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. Visit dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. And that is it from that Great Business Show, episode 151. Great business insights and inspiration, all thanks to our sponsor, Dundeal.ie. It's the only place to find your next car, new or secondhand. And do sign up for email updates and for your own personal copy of the podcast at thatgreatbusinessshow.com. That's where to go if you would like to advertise with us. We record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios where... Monsieur Lee Brennan is today's sound engineer. And our grand fromage studio manager, Peter Rice, uses his feathered duster later on to make us the world's best-sounding business podcast. So from me, Conal O'Moran, we'll you all a good time.